Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Okay. Andy. <laughs> My name's Ashley. Ashley <laughs> Nelson. I'm Patrick. <laughs> Roost. It's not funny. Mine's not funny. My tra it's not funny. Your you, Travoltified name. My Travoltified name is not funny. It's dumb. Yeah, you got you got kind of uh, I got hosed by Travolta hosed me. Yeah, he really did. What did you think of the uh Oscars in general? In general, I enjoyed them. 
I was uh, perplexed by uh, Spike Jones's accepted speech. Oh, that disappointed me. But I think for it the really part. disappointed me because I didn't expect the crazy. It was it was not like so much crazy as uh, like I don't know if it's loopy avant garde. It, yeah, it was really avant garde. Like I'm talking to people who aren't there, sort of <laughs> conversation. I really just didn't get what he was doing. Hang I'm sure on, maybe, everybody, we're gonna get weird. It made sense in his head, maybe, but yeah. I'm that's not. The, that's I'm not sure. One, I believe that. That's the one movie I haven't seen yet of the nominees. It it left theaters so fast here, it like blinked and it was gone. So I'm gonna have to wait on that one. I'm yeah. a little bummed. Yeah, it'll come. Uh, but overall, you feel I was surprised. I was actually surprised, and it's different. My surprise is different from what I felt. You mean you know surprised from the winners? Yes. Yes. There was okay. some that surprised me, but you know, this is a this was a first year that I can remember in a long time where I didn't have an all out personal favorite in any category. There were some that I thought, oh, okay, that, that's there's definitely that's not going to be a win. But in general. Every category, I thought they were all great films, and it, I would be happy with any of them. Yeah, it was really kind of a year of just a lot of great stuff. So yeah. it was. It did make it kind of like, okay, yeah. I can see that. I mean, I'm I'm bummed that my pick didn't win, but meh, that's okay. Yeah, but there, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna too. feel bad. I'm not gonna be all right. angry up in it. <laughs> uh, I because Ellen wouldn't like that. Ellen maybe. wouldn't like that. She'd get <laughs> hostile. Yes, she does. I uh, I'll tell you, I was surprised because um, we've talked about we talked about the gravity, and we talked about gravity being you know I think we our conversation was about you know gravity being a visual effects film or a cinematography film in terms of wins. Yes, and it went and won both. Yeah. So I thought that's momentum I didn't see coming. I thought the Academy was gonna was gonna pick a route route. We're going to root it. Do you route the enemy or root I the think enemy? Uh, you you root the routers. Root them on. You don't even know. Ra ra. Mm-hmm. No, uh, I don't know. They were going to pick a direction, and I didn't think it was going to have any. Uh, there. But it, but then it uh, it actually did uh, fairly well for itself. Yeah, I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I, personally, I would like to have seen Gravity win. I feel of all of the nine, it was the the one that really stood out as something really special. Um, but, you know, like you said, they were all good. 12 Years a Slave is a very powerful, strong film, and I was totally fine with that winning. Yeah, me too. I yeah, they Yes, they were all fine films. Um, so overall, the Oscars are not a whole lot to report. I was not in... Uh, in case you, you you know, had a, any sort of sense or to look for me, I was not in Ellen DeGeneres' selfie. Oh, you, oh, you weren't, huh? I was I was actually looking for you in there. Like Ellen said, it's just a shame that Bradley Cooper's arm wasn't long enough because then I have a feeling that you would have been seen. We, <laughs> I would have been in it. That's, That's right. right. I totally would have been in it. <laughs> um, so, all right. So Oscar's general thumbs up. Ellen did a good job. Yeah. Dodgers is funny. I yeah, I I'm one of those people. I liked when she ordered pizza. I did too. I mean, it it was one of those things where it started going on a little too long, and then it kept going, and it became funny again. So when the pizza arrived, yeah, then it was there was good payoff. It she's was funny. That Ellen, she's got some comedic instincts. And then she had the the pizza guy on on her show. Did you see that? <laughs> I did not. Where she's talking, she brings him out and, and is talking to him and, and she's like, so did you have any idea as to what was going on? He's like, no, I, I, you know, was bringing the pizza and they said it was for some writers or something. And then you walk in and you say, okay, just wait here with me for a second. And you say, okay, come on, let's go. And then they walk through, you know, through the, the <laughs> curtains or whatever. And they're on the stage and he had no idea <laughs> that he was about to be on uh, international television. That's and, brilliant. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, I guess he has always had a crush on Julie Roberts, and then there he was serving pizza to her. So he said it was a, <laughs> a bit of a surreal evening, and then Ellen gave him all the money from Farrell's hat, which ended up being $1,000, so he made out pretty well <laughs> for his night. Yes. Wow. Yes, indeed. Nicely done. <laughs> oh, that's great. Ah uh, yes. It was a good it was a good night. Did you have a good party? Uh yeah, me and, and me and the fam. That was it? You didn't you didn't go to a big thing? 
No, the kids aren't quite. They're not there yet. Ready to do that on Oscar night? You know, we're yeah. still putting them in bed midway through. And it's just oh, yeah. doesn't work out very well yeah. quite yet. Hey, I want to follow up with you. I finally saw. Uh, not only did I see, I, I've now seen in the last week seventeen times uh, Frozen. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it is. It immediately became a staple in our home. Oh yes. Uh, not only is it a super adorable movie. Uh, the music is very catchy, and my kids now know all of it. Oh, yeah. I am right there with you. My daughter still listens to the soundtrack. She falls asleep to it looping every night. Oh, every funny. single night. Yes. Funny, funny. Uh, yeah, it was it was good stuff. Although, uh, you know, my wife's reaction is we were all sitting there watching it. You know, during the uh, during Let It Go, right as she's raising the ice house, mm-hmm. <laughs> my reaction is really Disney. Did you have to make her quite so curvy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my. right. It's a story about the sexy Winter Sisters. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, too anyway, funny. It was funny. So uh, that's all I got. Let's I have no people. problem. I have no problem with the sexy winter sisters. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everybody. It's the next reel. I'm Pete Wright. That over there is Andy Nelson. Say hello to the people, Andy. Woohoo. And we spoil movies. It's what we do. It's the thing we love to do more than anything else in the world. And uh, so <laughs> what you... <laughs> is that a weird thing to, to really love doing? anything. Anything in the world, we're going to spoil it. If, it please, Come if you're over, near we'll us, spoil one for mention you. a movie, we're going to spoil it for you. You can find uh, out about us some more if you head over to thenextreel.com, read the blog stylings of the goodly, kindly Steve Sarmento. You can um, uh, see all of the films, all the series that we've done. You can catch up with the film board. Uh, and make sure you join the conversation online. We would appreciate it if you jump in on Facebook or Google Plus or uh, yeah, mostly Facebook. But, you know, if you're on Google+, Plus, go there, too. We'd love to, to see that uh, perk up a little bit. And, of course, Twitter uh, at The Next Reel. Um, and, uh, oh, last but, of course, not least, if you subscribe to the show, which we recommend you do, head over to iTunes and, uh, you know, dig in your pocket and find those last five stars and leave them on our show page as a review. We would really appreciate it because uh, the more uh, nice reviews we get, the uh, the more the show shows up for other people when they search for uh, movie podcasts, which yep. I know is a real uh, trending topic right now, is movie podcasts with Pete and Andy. <laughs> and we want to we want to show up. That's right. So we did we did get some uh, more feedback from our uh, favorite Leisha Lynn over uh, on our flick chart page. <laughs> she <laughs> yes. She's definitely. What, is, uh, what does Leisha have to say to us? At, because is, I'm sure it's <laughs> more where she doesn't, if she <laughs> disagrees with me. Actually, this is a direct. Uh, uh, this is a direct comment to our uh, flick charting of our <laughs> last uh, the, with the abyss and close encounters. We've yes. created quite the conversation here. Andy may not get it, but I do. Pete, thanks for explaining your flick chart criteria. The elven bow over the slingshot. Is it? Thumbing your nose at the pioneers and diving into the abyss without looking back is fine. Sometimes I choose a newer fave over a classic two because it's legit to ask which film would I rather watch right now. That's the spirit. That's right. I thought it was going to be all venom and hate toward Pete because Andy's the cute one. And <laughs> now I see that Leash actually is. Uh, she's actually quite balanced and, and really very smart. Yes, and I will say... Because she got my metaphor. (laughs) She did, and I was like, what on earth are you talking about? We're in the land of Mordor now, and Pete is... (laughs) Uh, That's awesome. Uh, As always, deep thanks for commenting and uh, staying staying with us. Yeah, absolutely. That's really funny. (laughs) Andy may not get it, but I do. I'll tell you, if I had a dime... (laughs) (laughs) You'd have one dime. <laughs> <laughs> Says you, sir. I'm starting a jar. Are you? Okay. A jar of Andy's petulance. I'll send you an extra just so you have two. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, that's fantastic. I think, Andy, now we need to... Uh, do you have any other stuff? Because I think it's important that we now talk about uh, Andy versus the people. I think we should. Let's do it. This, this How, I, I was feeling pretty good this week. Tell me about it. I was like, really? I was... Uh, man, I just really had... I was on a roll. I made it through six images and before Ooh. someone finally... Uh, Alexander C. Curran finally uh, pegged it with the tennis... Uh, what, what do you call those things? The tennis ball... The shooter. Machine. Yeah, the, the tennis, tennis ball, ball the tennis ball launcher. Uh, it says matchmate on the box. Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the little tennis ball shooter. And he knew right away, seeing that, that that was from the movie Fletch. None of the other images uh, really quite pinpointed the movie. I picked some pretty <laughs> obscure images specifically on purpose because I really wanted to see if I could drag this out for almost a full week. And I did. So congratulations to Alexander C. Curran. You are entered to win our pony prize. I'm telling you, you brought the rain. When you uh, picked the, far- the, the the picture of the pigs at the farm uh, <laughs> right. the house, and, and the, the best, uh, I, uh, given that the movie is Fletch, the best guess, I think, was Food Inc. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that was Fantastic. great. Yeah, I was like, I'm really, really leading them yeah, down all the wrong roads this week. <laughs> crushed it. Crushed it. Uh, you know, Clockwork Orange, Platoon, Godzilla. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, so good, so good. A- I'm I'm proud of you, Andy. I feel like you've you've got some of that old magic back. I you know I was feeling like feeling pretty good. So I, I you know I, I still have only had one week where I took I completely flabbergasted. I shouldn't say flabbergasted, but flummoxed. What's the right what we word? Call, is, that a, is that an ace? Uh, uh, is that a film ace? Or puffled, where yeah. I got everybody uh, stumped for an entire week. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'm holding out for another one of those one of these days. But, you know, it's okay. I, I had fun this week. It was a good week. Cameron, Cameron L. Ryan with the new hashtag, total stab in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you notice the I, I final to... countdown <laughs> with the Doberman. <laughs> Uh, uh, it was very uh, light on uh, cinematic architecture, unless you count the pig farm. But uh, I was but, I was worried about that one because you you dropped that one early. Yeah, yeah. So. But it's I don't know. It's kind of an obscure one. I mean, the nice thing about Fletch is he really is all over the place <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> Joel, Joel. This comes with another new hashtag. Godzilla, I suck at this game. <laughs> hashtag, I suck at this game. <laughs> That was a great hashtag, yeah. <laughs> this was a treat. Uh, well done, Andy. Oh, thank you. Fun uh, week, fun week. So congratulations, week. Alexander C. Curran. I'm going to go first. Do you know why? Because I'm, I'll tell you. Um, because we skipped this one. Because we oh, had yes. some, we did a little scheduling uh, mix-up, and we we this we had to record a, a couple of days early, like two weeks ago, mm-hmm. and the trailer came out the day after. We would have talked about this trailer, but we we missed it. And that trailer is James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, that's right. What do you know of this film? Uh, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question, Pete. <laughs> Is it? Let's see. I'll be the judge of that. As a kid. No, this is kind of interesting. As a kid, I actually had a Rocket Raccoon four-issue limited series comic book uh, set that I loved as a kid. I was completely obsessed with Rocket Raccoon, and nobody knew who Rocket Raccoon was because it's like like the weirdest superhero (laughs) that you could possibly have as this this raccoon who just, you know, fights— crime and whatever yeah so uh, so i had that and i was very excited to see and i didn't even know having this this four issue limited series that he was a part of this guardians of the galaxy thing i don't know if that came before or after this series that i have but i was just very excited to see that rocket raccoon is actually going to be in a movie and uh, the movie looks it looks really fun it looks like it's going to fit within the superhero universe but at the same time it's like the kind of the uh it's it's like what we said about you know the the top gun and days of thunder how days of thunder is kind of like the 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 sibling of top gun but it's a little dirtier and naughtier and a little more fun to hang out with that's what <laughs> guardians of the galaxy feels like with like the avengers <laughs> totally 
I uh, there is a wonderful sense of irreverence in the trailer of this film. I am very much looking forward to it. I am not well versed uh, as as I should be in Guardians of the Galaxy lore. What I do know is that this is the first Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe film that Stan Lee has not been involved with in terms of uh, uh, he was not involved with this particular series. So uh, we won't get a Stan, Stan Lee cameo, and that is a little bit of a heartbreaker because uh, I've, I've grown quite accustomed to Stan. Yeah, he's always fun yeah. to um, see. Us. And also because I feel like I know the Stan Lee characters so much better than I know these guys. So I'm, I'm you know, very interested in what they do with it. The trailer is a lot of fun. Uh, again, if you, you know, if you aren't up to speed on this, we've got Chris Pratt uh, as sort of the the main hero uh zoe saldana karen gillian bradley cooper dave bautista and vin diesel as the voice of a giant tree alien <laughs> uh benicio del toro is in this one as well and we've already gotten a teaser of uh, benicio del toro's work as the collector at the end of thor the dark world that's what it was it was, thor. Or was it not the it was the mid credits one right yes yeah um, and so uh, we've seen a little bit of him, but this is where we get uh, we get to see the collector in action. So it it should be um, a fun uh, film. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too. I very much am looking forward to just how irreverent it's going to be. So yeah. so it uh, hits uh, United States August first, two thousand fourteen. Mark your calendars. Absolutely. My trailer is, uh, you know, David Gordon Green is an interesting director who started doing smaller, uh, more independent types of films. And then he kind of really changed course with his directing career and started doing things like Pineapple Express and Your Highness and The Sitter. And it was like, it was a very strange change in his career when he started doing those. But with Prince Avalanche last year, he's kind of switching back to doing stuff that seems a little more, I don't know, a little more on the kind of the serious and and interesting side. And uh, he did this movie, Joe, that's uh, coming out. It actually started playing festivals last year, but it's coming out this April. And uh, it's got Nicolas Cage in it and Ty Sheridan, who's uh, just been in some great films over the last couple of years between Mud and The Tree oh, of Life. Mud was great. Yeah, and he was great in it. Um, but Nicolas Cage is just getting so much buzz for this movie because he, they're saying it's, he's back in form. Like This is his best performance since leaving Las Vegas. So I'm really curious about what David Gordon Green is going to bring to this story. Um, Nicolas Cage is an ex-con who is just you know trying to just kind of work and, and just have his life not be interrupted because he's got violent tendencies and this boy and his father come looking for work and so he gives them work but then he sees that this boy's uh, his grandfather whatever is abusing him and he kind of is torn about getting involved in in this relationship there's something about the the way that the story is portrayed that really piques my curiosity and the fact that i mean i have always enjoyed watching nicholas cage even when he's in just crazy outlandish movies because he's just so over the top and I have so much fun watching him. But this looks like like definitely something where he's really giving us a great performance. And Ty Sheridan. I mean, really enjoy uh, Ty Sheridan. And Ronnie Jean Blevins is in this, and I worked with Ronnie on uh, on uh, Ambush at Dark Canyon. So uh, I was excited to see that he was popping up. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. So, yeah, this looks good. I'm not usually keen on... uh... You know, these are usually movies I rent. Well, yeah. yeah and, and that's what I'm, I'm just saying, all I have to say, drive angry. <laughs> well, that's definitely a rent for free type of movie. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's wait till it's streaming. I'm not saying that I, I actively go see all of Nicolas Cage's films when they hit the theaters, but this one looks like it's one that is worth spending a little extra money on and seeing uh, in the theater if uh, if it's in your area. When uh, when does it hit? Did you say already? April eleventh. That's when it's going coming to right hit. up. It, yeah, it'll be here soon. All right. Hey, nice job. And it, you know, it must be trailer season, getting ready for uh, the summer um, release schedule. And so, wow, lots of awesome trailer. I already have my trailer picked for next week. <laughs> I could potentially have my trailers picked for like the next month. Right. There's so many good trailers out there. Uh, right? I know it's looking really good. So there Indeed. we go. Indeed. All right. 
Hello, my name's Forrest, Forrest Gump. Would you like a chocolate? Oh, thank you. It's funny what a young man recollects. You're the same as everybody else. You are no different. Your boy's different. Are you stupid or something? I'm as stupid as a stupid does. I'm Jenny. I'm Forrest, Forrest Gump. She was my most special friend. My only friend. We was together all the time. We was like peas and carrots, Jenny and I. Run, Forrest! Hey, stupid! Run! Now, you wouldn't believe it if I told you, but I can run like the wind blows. Who in the hell is that? And there's Forrest Gump, coach. Just a local idiot. I never thought it would take me anywhere. Congratulations. How does it feel to be an All-American? I got a B. <laughs> I believe he said he had to go B. <laughs> now, maybe it's just me, but... College was very confusing times. Have you ever been with a girl, Forrest? I sit next to them in my home economics class all the time. Have you given any thought to your future? Go! What's your sole purpose in this army? To do whatever you tell me, drill sergeant? You're a damn genius! You are going to be a general someday, go! Yes, drill sergeant! They sent me to Vietnam. Listen, you promise me something, okay? If you're ever in trouble, don't try to be brave. You just run, okay? Okay. Where are you boys from in the world? Alabama, sir. You twins? No, we are not relations, sir. For some reason, what I was doing seemed to make sense to people. Forget about me! Get yourself out! I've been awarded the Medal of Honor. How come? Now, my mama's always tell me how miracles happen every day. <laughs> Some people don't think so, Jenny! but they do. Paramount Pictures presents Tom Hanks. I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. Robin Wright. Will you marry me? I'd make a good husband, Jenny. You would, Forrest. But you won't marry me. Gary Sinise. I never thanked you for saving my life. And Sally Field. My boy Forrest is going to get the same opportunities as everyone else. A film by Robert Zemeckis. What's my destiny, Mom? You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. You know Forrest Gump, Andy? Let me tell you about Forrest Gump. So Forrest Gump, uh, I don't know if you know this. Tom Hanks is in it. Uh, a screenplay by Eric Roth based on the book by Winston Groom. Have you read uh, Have you read the book? I have read the book. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing. I have not read the book. I'm looking forward to hearing what you think about this. Uh, it, it, there's a, a relatively um, unknown director, Robert Zemeckis, I believe is how it's pronounced. Zemeckis. You might not, he? not have heard about him. He's a director of film. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so he made this little, it's a little film uh, called Forrest Gump in 1994. And now, was it based on a book or was it inspired by a restaurant chain? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. It this, inspired a restaurant chain. <laughs> this book is a riddle wrapped inside a Twinkie if I've ever seen one. I, uh, so this, I didn't, uh, I was one of those people when I first saw this film. I first saw it. I was not as keen on it as I am today. This movie has actually grown on me a lot. What do you think mm. of that? Punk. I like where I like what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I I want in some way to make up for last week. Is all I'm oh, saying. Good, because I know you were hurt. I was I was crying inside. Mm -hmm. yeah, a little splash of tears. I think laying down on my <laughs> keyboard. <laughs> I think Tom Hanks. I'm going to go on the record. Tom Hanks is better in Forrest Gump than he was in Splash. <laughs> Well, it's a good thing they gave him the Oscar for the right movie. Then. <laughs> <laughs> there was debate. They were going to do an honorary kind of a thing, but they decided not to. Uh, so those smart people. What do you uh, What do you think of old uh, Forrest Gump? You know, I uh, this is a movie that I've loved since I watched in theaters. I, I think I saw it three times opening weekend. And, uh, you know, I was a little obsessed with it. And three, I, three times opening weekend. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's I about saw a two and a half hour film. Yeah, yes. I thought a lot of my a lot of my weekend was spent watching this movie. Why? I'm really curious why that is. It was, you know, it's one of those things where I saw it opening night. Mm 
and I was very excited by it. And I told my, my parents are divorced. So I told my mom, you have to go see this movie. And so I drove up to see it with her and we watched it. And I told my dad, you have to see this movie. And so then on Sunday, I went over to hit him and we went and watched it. So it was one of those things where I just like had to drag everybody out to go see it. Wow. That is, that's commitment. It was. Okay. So and, go and on. I interrupt. Yeah. So. I don't know. It's just a movie that really hit me uh, with this, the story and the emotion and the relationship that Forrest has with the people in his life and the people that come in and out uh, in this tapestry of his life and how the story is told and how it's, it's weaved across uh, such a, a you know, kind of a, a pivotal several decades in, in the growth of the country. And it, it, it just always... I, I'm not one of those people who has ever remotely been able to look at this movie from, I mean, there's a lot of interesting th thought and um, uh, rhetoric about what, you know, what the movie really means and how subversive it is, subversive it is, it, it is and all of that. I've never been able to step outside of the movie and, and look at it that way. And I find it so interesting that people can, um, and uh, I guess I just don't, I, I, I don't, I, I feel like people are really digging for things when a movie does really well and they're trying to find things that, that could potentially be said in the movie and stuff like that. Um, I, I've just always been able to sit down and just watch this movie and enjoy this story of these characters as they go through life and, and some struggle more than others. And, and there's always just this path that it kind of forest is kind of plowing through time and all of these people and how he kind of changes them and they change him and everything. I've always found it a beautiful film and I love it. Tell me what you mean when, uh, about the subversive, uh, piece, what, what are we, are, are people watching this film backwards and listening for, I am the devil. I am the devil. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? That's pretty much what's happening. You know, <laughs> I, I think, um, well, there's, you know, I, I pulled up this article that um, Eon Scoble wrote back in 95. So a year after the movie came out, this is a professor of philosophy, at the chairman of philosophy department at Bridgewater State University of Massachusetts. Uh, Eon wrote... Uh, let me find it here. The film, this film is subversive. It doesn't subvers subvert the Constitution of the United States, but rather it is subversive of the human spirit. This claim will come as a spoil sport, voice in the wilderness to the many who are trumpeting the film as a triumph of the human spirit. Forrest Gump is unambiguously anti-intellectual and subversive in its power to make one enjoy it anyway. And then... Uh, they go on to say, Forrest Gump's not a bad film, but it is subversive. It's subversive because it is so well-made and enjoyable. It, basically, they're saying that it's portraying, you know, this, this innocent person who has a very low IQ as somebody who's able to make an amazingly successful life for himself. He, you know, makes his way through Vietnam. He becomes this amazing ping pong player. He meets, what, three or four presidents, uh, gets a Medal of Honor. Um, he creates this amazing uh, shrimping business and has this amazing life. But he's an idiot. He's just somebody who kind of floats through life and doesn't really have to do anything. And so people who aren't anti or who aren't dumb people who are smart and trying to make choices like jenny who uh, you know she suffered abuse and she's trying to make choices to get through life now are uh subjected to uh, you know just awful situations and in, in you know the the she gets into the kind of the counterculture movement and is trying to make a change but because of the changes that she's trying to make she ends up falling in with abusive people and ends up getting aids which she dies from and uh, uh, lieutenant dan is very very um you know fighting the system and very angry because he's be, been uh, rescued and he's forced to now live as a cripple and so he's fighting life and everything and it's not until he's able to accept God and and kind of become you know one again with the, the kind of the spirit of this this world that he's able to kind of get legs again and so you know the people and then conservatives they latched on to this film I think it was Pat Buchanan when the movie came out who said it's this conservative film it celebrates the values of conservatism of the old America of fidelity and family faith and goodness 
and the way of life this film holds up to be squalid and ruinous is the way of Woodstock. And, you know, it, it, I don't know. I think the liberals, when the movie came out, they complained that the film didn't latch on to feminism and other liberal elements. But I think there is a lot of liberal stuff going on in the film. I guess I, I can see all of these people's points. But I think that's digging into a film that... Uh, and a story that these filmmakers and storytellers were not telling. I think these people were telling a very different story about a person who is innocent and is able to kind of have this journey in his life that, yes, he happens to bump into all these different situations, but through that, um, you know, he's able to kind of just not be affected by the 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 awful politics of George Wallace, or or he's not kind of touched by all of the the goodness and badness and all these different things he just kind of moves through and through his eyes we are able to kind of get this sense of the world and the time and then i think through jenny and uh, lieutenant dan we're able to see uh, you know just a lot more of the other sides of things that are going on and then kind of how they change through their relationship with forrest gump thanks for joining us everybody (laughs) you (laughs) asked i love that you are uh, that you are so inspired uh uh, by this film uh i agree with you and i i think the reason uh i did not uh, like this film as much when i first saw it is i was not in a place to understand what it was doing um, and I, I feel like or what it was doing or, or, or to allow it to, or, or, or let's say, uh, I was not enabled to uh, receive the impact of the relevance of this film. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. I, I think I was just, uh, I was too young and dumb. What I love so much about this film and is uh, that Forrest becomes a lens through which we are allowed to reprocess some of the most important historical moments of our of modern history and to reapply a new sense of context of the relative importance of those things and to me that is very much the lesson of Forrest Gump that the weight of the world is heavy on us right as human people mm-hmm and so much of what we do to one another, the the struggle and strife and the stresses that we carry around with us, is it's manufactured. We manufacture it through our relationships that evolve into politics, that evolve, in, evolve into conflict. And Forrest is a character that I I feel like I've never met on film. Right? I I, I haven't read the book. I didn't know this character. It's it's a it's a character that is not in my experience a trope uh it it is a unique view of allowing me to reprocess um based on this fellow who is gifted uh to not have to feel the weight of the complexity of the world around him right and for us to see you know what um this guy knows exactly what he needs to know to get through his life and to be productive and not only that uh, we get to experience joy uh, in through in his experience, even in some of the most troubling situations. Um, you know, I, I I think I was I was more impacted this time around seeing the um, the rescue scene in Vietnam mm-hmm. when he you know carries these people out uh, of the uh, of the war zone um, and that he is doing it for such pure reasons, uh, just because that's what you do you uh i don't think i really understood uh what that meant when i saw it the first time around and yeah. and i think he is uh, as a result of being able to reprocess some of these heavy heavy uh manufactured stressful moments in our history uh through the eyes of Forrest Gump i think what what you know the filmmakers have done is is give us a a way to to uh, look at our own uh, the way we react to our own stresses in our own lives. And I think, you know, the, the run across the country is, is one I do want to talk about because that was, as, I, as far as I understand, it was not in the book. Uh, and, right. and yet the run across the country ends up being sort of a seminal point um, in the film because we see Forrest running for what he acknowledges is no reason really at all. 
Except just to kind of, you know, for, I think, what does he say? Something about forgetting the past or putting the past behind you. Yeah, he's b- putting the past yeah. behind him. But, but you know, in, in, by the by this point in the film, we know Forrest well enough to know that he's he's just moving forward. And it really is right. the gift of uh, the gift of being able to simply move forward, I, I think, yeah. that, that really we celebrate. And yet, um, you know, what we see here is his act of just being a pure, um, you know, pure momentum actually is the act of giving people hope around him, you know, anyway. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful message is like, it, it, you know, from the perspective of the followers, you know, the people who are running behind him and trying to manufacture the story that that makes this experience make sense to them uh, is is this idea of taking ownership of your own experience in in life you know and taking taking ownership is a is a, a powerful and bold way to live and and um so much of Forrest's passing and uh, through other people's lives actually gives him an opportunity to to be a, a little bit more reverent yeah so i you know i don't feel like i i had thought about this film on that level and uh, you know until i uh, you know years later and and uh, so watching it again this time uh, really cemented a lot of that experience for me. Did it's, you? Oh, go ahead. Well, you know, I was just going to say it. It's way too easy to focus on the Tom Hanksiness of it, uh, and and some of the criticism I think of, of the film that I've read is is so focused on. Uh, you know, uh, oh my gosh, you know, Tom Hanks is, uh, you know, I, the the drawl is too much. It's too artificial. He can't pull it off, and and I. Uh, I, I deeply disagree. I, I actually think he's uh, quite ingenious uh, in the film. And I think, you know, talking about individual performances is, uh, you know, about a film like this that was so popular and so successful uh, ends up missing the point entirely. You're just sort of fishing, uh, like you said, for, you know, fishing for subversion. But, um, right. you know, to me, I think it, it it really tells a much more powerful story when you look at it in um, the whole tableau. That yeah. Role. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think the, the persona of Forrest that Tom created is truly just a, a unique creation. And I, I find myself watching it every time feeling like, man, he holds that so well. He's so solid in that creation of this, Forrest Gump character through the whole film. I think I only catch one moment in there where I'm always like, gosh, he doesn't feel like he was on or in character in that one moment. What moment is it? It's when he's reassembling the weapon uh, when he and Bubba are in boot camp. And uh, he he does it, you know, Bubba's sitting there talking about all the shrimp and everything, and then Forrest goes, done drill sergeant! And the way he says that sounds like Tom Hanks talking, not Forrest Gump. <laughs> it's the only line in the whole film. But every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, he's not quite there in that line. That's but, funny. But, you know, he got that character from Michael Connor Humphreys, who played young Forrest. He, um, that's really kind of how Michael talks. That's kind of how his, he speaks. And so they ended up filming um, all of the, the stuff with the young kids first. And so Tom was kind of watching... Uh, I mean, I don't think it was like intentionally, but that's just how it was scheduled. And so as he was still trying to find that Forrest character, he was watching um, the young Forrest and he really just kind of latched on to that drawl that Michael just spoke with and ended up that became the character. I love it. I actually, uh, I love it. And, and I love that story. I did not know that until looking, uh, you know, researching for this film and, and uh, I, you know, Check me on this if you disagree. But when I the you know first saw this film, I thought that it was the kid that uh, sounded more manufactured to me. Which is funny, yeah, because it, he's he's definitely the one who he's he, the one like who if, found if the character, any, right? If you watch any of the back back screen, uh, your behind this behind the stage sorts of things, it's like he talks that way. Just like when he's talking, that's how he speaks. It's funny. <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah, uh, it's it's a great performance. The uh, the other one to talk about um, is Jenny. I have been in love with Robin Wright since uh, Princess Bride, and so it was very. I was very happy to see her in this as Jenny, and 
if anybody can portray just a, a character who is dealing with just emotional angst, I swear it, it's it's her because she carries that so well in all of the scenes where you can see that that heartache behind her eyes as she's trying to sort her life out. Robin really carries that incredibly well and it's funny watching her now on house of cards how she's using that in a totally different and much more frightening way oh, are we, <laughs> that was going to be my comment like that the comparison is incredible yeah um she's uh quite stunning yeah um uh, and so in in this film in particular the you know i think she is uh, sort of the boomerang uh, around which you know we get to watch Forrest kind of chase. Yeah, and um, she's the other anchor character. The way she keeps bopping back into the story, um, you know, again to provide a reframing of how the culture has changed over time, right? And and we see her go through in in many respects more drastic, uh, you know, evolutions. Uh, you know, as she grows up, um, you know, particularly as she's, you know, moving through the, the counterculture period and and um, and then sort of back again. Uh, what, what we get out of her is our ability to to see in stark contrast what it means to be living in that life under such weight of the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, that's the that's the difference, I, I think, between those two characters that is so interesting to me is we get to watch Forrest parade around with with liberty. And she, in her effort to find liberty, ends up being, you know, cursed. Yeah. She, uh, you know, it's it is something that uh, going back to my diatribe I had uh, earlier don't ever apologize for being here. <laughs> there was a, uh, you know, again, people say, you know, this film is horribly um, mean to uh, to the female characters. And, yes, Jenny has to suffer through a, a lot of horrible stuff over the course of this film, um, just like Lieutenant Dan and Bubba. I mean, a lot of people have to suffer through a lot of things in this film. But, you know, I don't know. It, it falls on, on, you know, the the... The, is it on the writer's shoulders for writing the character that way? In the context of the story, I don't think there's any... I, I think it's a really fleshed-out character, and I think that the journey of Jenny over the course of this film is a really... Uh, you know, it's a touching and heartbreaking one, starting as a, a young girl who's being, uh, you know, uh, abused in, in potentially multiple ways by her father, and it just has a really rough start to her life. And then from that hard, uh, awful start, ends up just you know going down some of the wrong roads, going down roads where she's trying to find the right path for herself but never quite gets there. And it's not until the end where she really kind of is able to kind of just come to terms with the life that she has, I think. And I, I really do enjoy watching her journey. And I, I think that she delivers it. And in the, in the context of the story, I think it is a really, uh, it's a really touching journey that she takes. I do too. And I, I also, uh, you know, I think the case can be made that we would not understand Forrest as well if we didn't have her as, you know, for him to play off of. I mean, she has to be going through some of these incredibly dark uh, this this incredibly dark journey for us to understand his relationship with the world, yeah, right, and and his natural sense of uh, spirit of forgiveness, right. I mean, he is able to just it, not only you know, and I, I mean forgiveness in more sort of the pure sense that that is you know letting go of the past and and right. letting go of her past and not carrying around her background and her experiences and her choices um at any point he comes into contact with her but always being the protector and you know to be her husband yeah you know it's interesting in the book um uh, the relationship with Jenny is there it's a little different what happens though he when uh, Forrest I, I don't remember it I mean I read it probably a year after the movie came out so it has been a long time but he ends up going into space he like becomes an astronaut 
and his uh, the the person that he goes into space with is an is an it's either an ape an orangutan or some sort of uh, you know a, a monkey creature and named Sue and when they come back down and crash they get held as hostages by cannibals and as I recall I think that he actually ends up marrying the ape and so it was a very <laughs> okay, that's, that's different, different. And in the book. And I just, I, you know, I, I wasn't a big fan of the book. I mean, it had its moments. It has a lot of the elements um, of the early part of uh, kind of the, the story up until the war and everything. But And, and you know, he, he does do the ping pong stuff. And uh, at the very end of the book, he starts um, the shrimping business. But there it, it kind of takes a lot of strange turns and it's it seems like it's a little bit of a darker story I, I i didn't like it nearly as much as i liked the the movie and the interesting thing is when it had such huge success winston groom immediately wrote a sequel called gump and company that came out a year later and it was actually a sequel to, i mean it's called a sequel to the novel but it really is a sequel to the book because <laughs> There never was a uh, young Forrest that, you know, he never has a kid with Jenny in the original book. But this one starts with, you know, he's now got this kid and all this stuff. It's, it was very strange that he wrote a sequel to the book that was made from his original book. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, that, it sounds like uh, something I'm, I'm not going to put on my list. Right no, now. I, I didn't think it was. <laughs> I, I'd much rather just watch the movie again. Yeah. <laughs> this is an example of the movie does it it just does uh, it does it really well it does what it does really really well yes um uh robert zemeckis he this was you know at a point in his career i mean he's always been a director who's kind of pushing the envelope a little bit with what you can do with the the tools that you have at your disposal as a filmmaker and uh, you know he had done a lot of great films leading up to this, and um, a lot of I, I think from this point he had done a lot of films that some people question, but a lot of I think for the most part good films still. Um, this film came I don't know I, I don't think he was making anything serious really before this. I mean I, w I mean Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a fantastic film, uh, Romancing the Stone, the Back to the Future trilogy, Death Becomes Her. Uh, I didn't recall it being that good, but definitely he was pushing the the uh, envelope with the technology there. And then Forrest Gump comes along, and uh, it really kind of pushed him I think into that upper echelon of somebody who can. T not just make really fun films, but tell really powerful stories. And then, you know, I think he did that also with Contact and uh, Cast Away and Flight. And, you know, he does have that little spell in the 2000s where he was doing his his uh, the uh, motion capture films. Right. I think I'm one of the few people who uh, can make it through those and, and not have a problem with it. I think most people... I know I've I've pushed you a, a time or two. Hey, let's do let's do a Robert Zemeckis motion capture series. And you're, <laughs> you're not quite well, not quite on board with me. You know, I that's uh, I, I don't know that that's entirely fair. I you're talking about like um, Polar Express, Polar Bay Express, Wolf, Christmas Carol, and uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's those three. I don't think uh, Mars Needs Moms was. I think he no. just produced that one. I you know what I would do that series. I, and I'll tell you why. I've actually never seen A Christmas Carol. But Polar Express is a big favorite, and Beowulf, I think, is interesting enough to talk about. Well, now, What do you think about that? <laughs> I, I was surprised. I, I seem to remember you saying that it was, it was too creepy watching those uh, those people. I'm not saying I won't say that again. Uh, no, and I, I say that, too. <laughs> I still feel it's a little creepy, but I don't know. I still can make it through and enjoy the film. So. There's a there's a lot of good stuff going on in those films. So that's that'll be a conversation for future Pete and future Andy to address. Yes. Uh, but I'm I'm open. I uh, I think you know you talked about the um, you know pushing the envelope with visual effects. This film is, um, it's one of those films on the curve of visual effects films, where we see. What we see on screen, and I remember at the time, this I do remember that um, you know the visual effects in this film were stunning to me the first time I saw them because I could not see them. Yeah. And uh, this was the first time I remember seeing a film 
in which the visual effects were used in such a way strictly to tell the story and not to wow me with some new bit of technology. Right. Right. Which is exactly what he was doing in Death Becomes Her. Right. Right. The hole in the thing. And the, it right. was just not. It, 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 that's right. And so uh, in, in this case, what they pulled off, and, and I think it starts even with the feather, uh, you know, blowing yeah. in the wind uh, and, and coming to, to rest, uh, you know, at his feet. I, there is uh, it's beautiful. But then to watch the compositing that they ended up doing and, and the, um, uh, you know, changing the historical figures to match Forrest's story was really stunning. Can, what Talk about that. Uh, it, it is. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's very easy to focus on on what now when you watch it, it, it looks a little rough, which is the lips um, of these especially, famous figures. Yeah, especially Kennedy. I always struggle with Lennon. I think I think oh, everybody, yeah. yes. everybody ends up having somebody that they that one of them that is worse than others. Um, it's interesting. They were talking about Lennon and they're saying, you know, it's it's he's he his lips don't move in the way that you would expect. And, and you know, it's it was funny that they said that because that's the sort of thing that you don't think that a special effects person is going to have to deal with. But it's like they have to analyze how does that person move their lips? Yeah. Where they're trying to do that, but I think aside from the lips, and <laughs> I, I, I think Kennedy looks like a jib jab. Yeah, I, they're all a little awkward. I mean, it really, it really is a little awkward now, looking right. back on it in particular, uh, twenty years later, um, seeing how it's a little rough. But if you look at everything else that they did, I mean, in those with, that you don't even realize that you know, there's one of those shots of Kennedy. He's actually in the rose garden. And they pulled him out of the Rose Garden and put him into that the context of of that All American lineup yeah. where he's in his office. They are the way that they have to plot out the movements of Tom Hanks as he was moving through it. They have to go, okay, so you got to step here. Okay, now you got two seconds. You got to step to here, and then you got to stay there, stay there, and then move and, and in order yeah. to fit within the context of that. Oh stuff. dear God, an eye line. Yeah, uh, I mean, right. it's amazing. Putting little, putting little dots in places so that he knew where to look and yeah. where to put his hand. And, I mean, it's it's mind-boggling. And yes, now when you look at it, you can say, "Gosh, the lips just don't look good." Uh, it, what what we can do now with our technology that they couldn't do in '94, but you don't realize that all of the extra stuff that they were actually doing that you're not even noticing because yeah. it's so good. That's right. And you you know, I'll tell you. I mean, e- even if. Uh, because it's it's sort of a high profile thing to put Tom Hanks next to a character that we or next to a, a real historical figure that we know is has gone. Uh, but I did not know much of Gary Sinise when I saw this movie in 1994, and I swear for a year I thought that he was an amputee actor. I think most people did. I had never seen him either, and I was convinced that it was like, uh, what was it the it was the best years of our lives? The movie um, with that cast an actual uh, soldier who had come back from the war and he was missing limbs. I was like, I was convinced that they cast somebody who didn't have legs. Yeah, amazing. And and you look at the effects work that they did in that to fool you aside from the fact that okay yes they've done it in movies a lot where somebody doesn't have a leg and it's like are their feet folded up under the wheelchair or what and the way that they found to kind of trick you into believing that it was real like when the the uh, nurse picks him up to put him on the uh, the medical uh, uh, the little table um they he had blue stockings on his legs there was holes in the bed that his legs were in and the the guy picks him up and then moves him and then they digitally smoothed out the sheets and they made the little uh, the the little ends of his legs and it's just amazing or like the table in his room when he's spinning he's on the floor and he's turning himself around and his legs spin past a table that right. there's no way somebody with legs could do but there they actually there was no table there there was a mark on the ground where the table was later than digitally put in uh that you see that was for me that that was more amazing than any other effect in the film yeah well, and that's that's what I think is so amazing about this film is there are effects going on all the time that you don't even know are there. Whether it's a digital sky replacement or mm-hmm. the duplication of crowds in some of these big scenes, like the stadium, the football scene, or the uh, at, or at the, the reflecting uh, pool. Yeah, yeah. reflect pool. Um, there are. Um, moments where you've got just you know different things being painted out in the background, 
or added in uh, just all over the place. And it really is stunning the the amount of work that they did to add all this or the ping pong balls. I mean, there's not any ping pong balls. They're just all, you know, using metronomes and, and clickers and pretending to hit balls that that aren't really there. Right. I mean, it, it just blows your mind. It really does. Um, and now, does it does does all these uh, you know putting uh, forest in in all of these uh, situations does it did you find uh that it reduced the impact of those situations or your memory of them uh, in the context of their real historical import uh, i don't think so i mean I didn't live through a lot of those situations, so it's hard for me to look back and, and reflect on the reality of them. But, I mean, it's not like they were picking critical moments like where JFK was assassinated or something like that. I mean, they're picking, you know, a lineup of football players in, in you know, getting all American players just greeting the president. Which may, so, yeah, which, you know. Yeah, which which did happen. I right. mean, that's something that the players did, did do. I mean, sure, you've got the little cute moment of him in the bathroom seeing the picture of Marilyn. But, you know, I don't know. I, I It didn't really change anything for me because this is a movie. It's not like it's not like somebody is doing this in context of, you know, reality trying to sell you on something that's not there. Like that damn hoverboard, <laughs> funny or die, <laughs> I'm talking about you. <laughs> I, you know, I'm trying to figure out where I should and shouldn't be offended by this film, and I'm having trouble doing it. There are so many people who are so many critics who wrote, you know, that this, uh, you know, this film reduces the impact of some otherwise really important uh, periods of our history and and changes history in a way that that you know turns it into into you know cotton candy and and um uh, i i disagree with that but i i also think it it misses the point of the film this is as much as this is an effects film it is uh it's only an effects film if you miss the fact that it's a character film yeah, and I think that's what these people, like all these critics I was talking about earlier, they're all missing the sense that this film is not, I, I, I highly doubt, I mean, I haven't sat down and had this conversation with Robert Zemeckis. He's not returning my calls for some reason. Yeah, but he's I, mad. Yeah, he's a little mad. What can I say? Um, uh, but I, I haven't sat down with them to say, you know, were you trying to politicize and what was the point of all of this rhetoric that you're putting into your film? I, I have a sense that these filmmakers were actually just trying to tell a story about really interesting characters going through tumultuous times in our country and just giving us this character story, this relationship story between Forrest and Jenny and then these people who come in through their lives like Lieutenant Dan and Bubba. And, you you know, you really could make the same case that To Kill a Mockingbird did the same thing, right? Where we have these, we are shown the world through the eyes of an innocent yeah, uh, and and that it, and we're shown the world through the eyes of an innocent a very, at a very tumultuous time in our country's history, and right. and I think that's what um, you know Forrest Gump ends up doing in more of a um, it, it it's more of a theme park kind of a uh, atmosphere you know where we have to move from sequence to sequence rather than really invest in one, uh, but but I think we do that at the, the cost of of moving through history as quickly uh, is paid back. Uh, in uh, with interest in uh, our investment in the character. That's that's sort of my take on it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, who else do you want to talk about? Um, I think Michael T. Williamson is just awesome in this film as Bubba. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I don't know uh, uh, what's happened to him. I haven't seen him in stuff lately. Have you seen him lately? Wow. You know, that's a... That's a great question. Where is it? What was the last thing I, I feel like I saw him in? I mean, he didn't he do he did the Final Destination, um, which I felt like was kind of. Um, I mean, I'm looking at at his his uh, IMDb page. He's he's busy. I mean, he's in lots of stuff. He's been doing a lot of TV. It looks like. I mean, he was in 14 episodes of Justified. Uh, he was uh, you know an episode of Chicago PD. Um, some TV movies, TV series. Uh, he was in 24 for uh, no, that's a right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, he's definitely out there. He's definitely working still, uh, just not in things that I have been seeing. So uh, I definitely miss seeing him, though, because I, I really just loved Bubba in this, and he brought such a great presence that was a great 
um, kind of a, a reflection of Forrest in a different way. And just like that relationship that they create, just that moment. I always think about that moment where the two of them, where Forrest is sitting in the rain and Bubba comes up and, and sits behind him. is just like, hey, Forrest, I'm just going to lean up on you and you just lean right back up on me. And that way we don't have to sleep with our heads in the mud. Right. And it's just like, God, that is just like such a great little moment of friendship that is, it's just you know, defined by its its simplicity and its, uh, you know, the desire to just, you know, just be comfortable. And I, I just love that these two characters created such a comfortable relationship with each other that led to just this, you know, this actual restaurant chain. <laughs> yeah, you know, what's, what's fascinating by that is, you know, that we would... I don't know, I think this is what what interests me so much about his portrayal of this character is that the film is about a character that is totally unique and then they introduce another one. Yeah. Right? I mean, there are That's some true. That's so, true. Yeah. sort of inherent risks in that, but but the fact that these two characters kind of uh, seek each other out cosmically, yeah. I, I think, is is a really interesting choice. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful reflection on uh, especially when Bubba gets shot and is dying, and it, it, there's an interesting sense of that relationship between the two of them, and how you can almost see how maybe Forrest gets a sense that it's like a you know it's a part of him that's dying. Yeah, right. You know, from the war. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, you know it's interesting to see the things that actually do appear to make a um, an impact on Forrest. You know, watching watching him deal with death. Mm-hmm. Uh, is is you know one of the more interesting kind of repeat sequences that we get. Yeah, it is. It's very heartbreaking. Uh, let's see other things you want to talk about before we uh, move into money. The um, I you know I think that the the script Eric Roth wrote is a uh, uh, just really solid. I mean, obviously we talked about the book a little bit, and uh, I think he smartly found a r- the right way to tell this story. And this is something we talked about way back in our Curious Case of Benjamin Button uh, episode. But I, it it still strikes me as so strange every time I watch either of these films how they are like um, siblings and the way that they're um, working. Uh, it really, I mean, it's it's almost in parallel with these different versions of very similar stories. I find so interesting, and the way that Eric Roth ended up telling these these two stories, one that feels much more of the heart and one that feels much more of the mind, but I find both journeys so compelling and so watchable, and uh, I, I just really found it uh, fascinating that he somehow... I, I almost feel like he pulled the wool over everybody's eyes when they made uh, Benjamin Button because it does feel like it has so many parallels to this one. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Uh, okay, find and replace. Find and replace. <laughs> right, find exactly. And replace. <laughs> find feather. Yeah. yeah. Hummingbird. That's it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I need to go watch Button again. Yeah. It is uh, funny. But but the way that he wrote the script, I think, is very smart. Um, and the the I, I don't want to call it a framing device, but you've got the the narration going on of Forrest set up with him in this uh, at this bus stop as he's just kind of relating his life to people that come through. And VO can be something that can work, and and it can also be something that is really awkward and you don't want to include in your scripts. But um, I think he smartly used it in a way where you're not just having voiceover for voiceover's sake, but it is Forrest sitting on the bench reflecting to these other people. And so in a way you're getting uh, his reaction to these, to the things that he's saying. And so I think moments like where he's telling the story of Vietnam and how everyone's dying and how Bubba dies and all that. And then it cuts to him on the bench and, and you see him say, and that's all I have to say about that. And you get that emotional kind of closure from Forrest right there. And Mm -hmm. it, it, is a beautiful way to have the voiceover working over the course of the film. And it's, there are so many examples of voiceover not working well in movies, but this is a perfect example of, of how voiceover when done right can really help carry the film. Oh, I think that's exactly right. And I, you know, it's because the, in you know, I, I, much of that is because the character is so unique, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That it's not VO for the sake of telling a story. It's, it's VO for the sake of sake of reacting to the story through the eyes of this character that you've never met before. Right? Yeah. You've never seen somebody like this interact yeah. with the world. And I think that's, uh, that's you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but that, that uh, uh, 
that's why this is so successful. Yeah. And there's a lot of voiceover in this film. Yeah. It's a voiceover I, film. It really is. It really is. And it works super well. Yeah, it works super well. One, uh, thing, that's, one thing that's funny in that moment that I – it always makes me uh, question the 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 moment when when he comes out of that moment. It, well, we we meet this this man sitting on the bench that Forrest is talking to, and that's the first time that we meet him when he comes out of that Vietnam. And the guy's like, "Oh, it was a bullet that jumped up and bit you." <laughs> and and that man is sitting on the bench with Forrest all the way through the shrimping stuff and how uh, Forrest finds out that, you know, Bubba or I mean that Lieutenant Dan had invested for them in Apple and now he's a millionaire. And this man gets up from the bench is like, oh, all this time we were sitting next to a millionaire. And then he walks off and I'm like. Wasn't this guy waiting for a bus? Why? Why did he just get up and leave? And now he's gone, and he just kind of wanders. Yeah, why off did in the he background. sit down in the first place? <laughs> it's like you right? get off the bus to sit at the bench. I, I just, I always laugh at that man because I'm like, where is he going? Did he just give up on his bus after all this time? Well, you know, to me, it's one of those that that does work because I. Um, you know, I get the feeling that uh, this, this is a little bit of the Barnum and Bailey kind of uh, syndrome that that or the or the the blessings of Barnum and Bailey that uh, uh, that Forrest is innately with which Forrest is innately given or gifted uh, that he uh, that people would be walking by. I can imagine them and just stop uh, yeah. to listen, you know. Uh, insofar as the nurse uh, at the beginning did not stop but listen, I mean she she was there, but. Um, you know, I felt like the, each with each listener, they got sort of more compelled by his story. Yeah. Uh, and I like that. I like that a lot. No, I, I can definitely I, see I that. am really, I was frustrated when he gets up and walks away that the very next thing Forrest does is pull out the magazine with him on the cover. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like that's, oh, come on, man. You wouldn't stick around just to <laughs> right. question him on this a little bit, to poke. Right. Right. So, he after after all that yeah. time listening to the story, that one thing trips him up. He's like, "Oh, I'm not going to listen to this anymore." Right. <laughs> when after just one question, one poke, one prod from the other person on the bench, he was willing to pull out this magazine and display right. the truth. So, anyway. Exactly. Exactly. Haley Joel Osment. Oh, yes, another wonderful actor who pops up in this that does a, a wonderful job. Oh, he does a great job. <laughs> Clearly He's a so boy who's so wee little Haley. He, Boy, he is. He's clearly somebody who's going places. <laughs> he done went places. Yes, he did. Uh, he was fantastic. Uh, let's see. Who else? That's Sally Field, of course. You love me. You really uh, love me. And I think what's funny with that is that Tom Hanks and Sally Field had been uh, romantically involved a few years earlier in Punchline. And so it was very, very kind of awkward to see. Now she's his mama. <laughs> but, you know, I think they had a little laugh about that, too. So, you know, it's it's hard not to oh, in situations like that. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, five years before this one came out. So, um, Gosh, uh, who else uh, stands out to you that you want? Oh, I, the, you know, there were a couple that I want to talk about, just not uh, that... Um, that were in the film, but alternatives to Forrest Gump, the fact that, uh, you know, I, and you always take Wikipedia with a grain of salt, but John Travolta, Bill Murray, um, uh, uh, both considered for this role, uh-huh. but ultimately Winston Groom imagined him being played by John Goodman. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a, an interesting twist. Yeah, that's the one that gets me. Yeah, yeah. And I believe... At one point, um, before I think it was before Eric Roth was actually uh, working on the script, I think that Terry Gilliam was uh, uh, had been offered the film. Now that would have been a different film. It would have been well. It probably would have fit much more in line with uh, the kind of the darker angle that Winston right. Groom's novel was taking. So right. Well, and that gets yeah. to some of the you know the the difficulty of of doing these adaptations that. As a Zemeckis, at the hands of of Roth and Zemeckis, that this becomes uh, a, a much more kind of uplifting film. Making that choice is is one that is um, that, that takes a lot of guts. Yeah. Um, uh, and and obviously it paid off here, but how many times doesn't it? Uh, Alan right. Silvestri yeah. crushes it with the score. 
Yeah, it's it's really, I mean, it's a, a beautiful score that uh, just gets me every time. I mean, I think that the themes that he has in this, the feather theme, Jenny's theme, all of it works so well. And I always am amazed at how um, melancholy the music is toward the end when you feel like, you know, these are moments that you'd like to feel are going to be really uplifting. But when when Jenny comes back into his life, it's very melancholic. And likewise, at their wedding, it's this melancholic music that just really is like breaking your heart because you know that, that Jenny's going to die soon. But the music is just gorgeous. And it's interesting the music, uh, the soundtrack for this really took off when it came out. Not ju- not the score so much, but the soundtrack itself. Because I mean, this movie. I mean, I tried counting as fast as I could as the credits were rolling by, but I counted 57 songs over the course of this this two hour and 21 minute movie. That's a lot of songs, uh, and this soundtrack uh, I think hit number seven on on the Billboard uh, chart. So um, actually, no, it even made it up to uh, number two, and it stayed there for seven weeks until Lion King uh, bumped it off of there. But um, it's uh, lots of great music in this, and the score is great. And uh, Alan Silvestri, um, when he met with uh, Zemeckis, they were talking about the the way that the music and the, the score would interact. And they decided that the songs would kind of help establish the landscape of the film and the story that we're in. And the score would kind of fill in the emotion of it. And I think it works. I think it does do that. Oh, it absolutely does. And this is a great example. It's like a case example of the power of songs to transport you through time in a film. Yeah. Uh, That when you hear the music, you are taken to a time and it just cements the the experience. And and you you have to in this film. And that's why this film is so good at it, because you're in each time for such a short period, uh, you know, in your journey through Forrest or with Forrest through his life that that you have to uh, you have to rely on every sort of sense trigger to get you there. And I think it just does it really well. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, Don Burgess's cinematography is uh, beautiful and is establishing the tone of the film, and especially with the widescreen palette that they were working in, I think it can be tricky in films that are so epic in scope like this, yet, yet at the same time so focused on character. But I think he really does a great job of, of with his palettes, everything all the way across the course of the film. You know, Jenny's palettes get kind of get darker and a little muddier as forests are a little more bright and and then they come together. And I but I think Don Burgess does so such solid work all through this, especially as a as a cinematographer who knows he's going to be having to deal with so much visual effects over the course of the film. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny to see where uh, so this was relatively early in his filmography right i mean in his career well, he started in the uh, er, in the early 80s um I guess but that's he, true. Uh, they hadn't been very many big things you know unless you count things like blind fury to be uh bigger but he hadn't done a lot of really big things until um yeah until i think this was uh the real big thing for him there are there are some films that really stand out to me as films that that are particularly reminiscent of this style and tone and and you know the the first one is comes in 1997 uh, Contact uh, which I thought was just a uh, you know a, I thought it was just brilliant I love that film and uh, you know then right away uh, Year 2000 is Castaway and and all of them have that same sort of of feel to them just using. Uh, using palettes to to move you through a, a certain kind of emotional arc, uh, and I think he he does that really really well. Yeah, and you know he's a, a cinematographer who is very much does his homework. Zemeckis tells the story when they were finding the right spot to build uh, Forrest's uh, mama's house. Um, they had found the plot of land, and the the art department had staked it out. And they put all the pieces out, and he pulled out his little, you know, like a little GPS type of device, and and talked to Robert about when are we going to be filming here again? Because it was still months and months away, and he calculated, okay, so that's going to be June, and so we got, so you know, he figured out where the sun was going to rise, and he says, okay, well, let's, can we turn the the house twenty degrees this way so that when the sun comes up, it's hitting the house right in the front, and we're going to get that gorgeous shot. 
And, you know, I think that just speaks to kind of great homework done by a great cinematographer, being able to kind of think ahead like that and, and find those right moments so that you get the look that you want. Right. And, I, yeah. Uh, I think you get that same sort of sentiment in, uh, in his uh, hit follow-up film, Christmas with the Cranks. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you, you know, they, hey, you know, you know you, they moved the house on that one. <laughs> you try stuff. <laughs> you know, there's a there's one um, cinematic moment that uh, uh, cinema cinematographic moment, I should say, something done in camera uh, that I think is really gorgeous that I have never noticed until it was pointed out to me at the very end of the film when Forrest and Jenny and Little Forrest are walking along the road that leads to their house. Um, it's it's toward the end of the film. It's this very happy moment of the three of them together, and they're walking along the road. As they walk along the road, if you watch that shot, it's actually a, an effects shot that you don't even realize is an effects shot because it was they were they were basically put into this into this shot from a different version of it. But if you watch the shadows on the ground, you will actually see that it is a time lapse shot. And the shadows of the trees change, and you can see them growing longer and moving across the road um, as they're just kind of walking down it. And it's really powerful shot as once you realize that you know it's, there is this time lapse shot, and it's really kind of reflecting the passage of time and just the relationship of these people and how it's almost this timeless this moment for them to be together. And it's it's really haunting, and I, I've always kind of caught that shot and and thought there was something about it that um, that uh, that piqued my curiosity, but I never could quite pinpoint it until it was pointed out to me. But it's a it really is a unique trick to do, and I, I was really quite impressed to see that they did that. I never noticed that. I'm going to have to go watch it right away. Yeah, absolutely. It's really cool. Wow. Um, uh, this movie performed well. Yeah, it did it's, a bit of all right. That's what they say. You know, they they do say that with uh, this movie. It uh, it you know, <laughs> they, hey, it made they, its money back. <laughs> it, it it did make its money back. You know, if you look at this movie and you don't adjust it for inflation, it is the number one movie on our list now. It finally we finally have pushed. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull out of the number one spot. <laughs> Red Letter Day. Yes, it really, truly Huzzah. is. Adjusted for inflation, um, it still is in the top ten, but Jaws, Close Encounters, and Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, are all beating it. But Forrest Gump is coming in at number four. Uh, yeah, this movie cost $55 million to make, which really kind of shocks me when you look at the scope of everything that they accomplished in the film. Yeah, it's stunning. It's amazing. I, yeah, it, it seems almost minuscule when you look at some of these bigger budgets like Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which cost $185 million to make. Uh. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, I couldn't find anything prints and advertising-wise, but, uh, yeah, so, it, you know, $55 million, And then if you look at how much it made domestically, it made about almost $330 million. Internationally, about $350 million. So all told, once you adjust that for inflation, it made um, – over one billion dollars domestic or internationally in the course of its run, so it did really well for itself, raking in almost seven million dollars per finished minute. Wow, that is a <laughs> successful film. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, go f run, Forest, run. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. wow. Well, it, you know, it's a terrific film, and it it's one that I think holds up much better than I, um, than I, uh, remembered it. Yeah. I think I, yeah, I just, like I said, I just think I wasn't ready for this movie, but I'm so glad we, uh, we threw it on the list. I thought it was, I, I thought it might end up being another one of those, um, one of those films. So, so the question, though. Because I know that um, this is something that uh, Steve Sarmento uh, threw out there when we talked about this. Do you think that it should have won Best Picture? This was the year that Pulp Fiction came out and kind of reinvented independent uh, film. It was nominated uh, with uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, Quiz Show, and The Shawshank Redemption. Those were the five films that were nominated. Um, I, I don't. At, I, wait. Uh, you see. 
wait, the so, five films that were not about Pulp Fiction, uh-huh. Forrest, uh, Gump. Forrest Gump, Quiz Show, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and, and the Shawshank and Redemption. The Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Um, I, you know, for me, I, it's a toss between this and Shawshank Redemption. I don't, I, I would not have put the other three on that same level. Four Weddings and a Funeral, definitely not. I mean, it's a very enjoyable film, but I, I've always kind of been uh, a little befuddled that it ended up getting nominated this year. Um, Pulp Fiction, I think it won the award that it. Uh, deserve to win. I don't think it should have won for Best Picture. I think, yes, I was very happy to see it win for Best Original Screenplay. I think that was a perfect award for uh, for the film. I mean, uh, I, I think Tarantino is an amazing writer. I think he is an amazing director. But I think Forrest Gump did just so much uh, for cinema and just cinematically. I, I really enjoy this film, and I, I am happy that it won Best Picture. I don't have any problem with that. I think you're right. Shawshank Redemption is the other one that I would pick on this list to win. Maybe Quiz Show, but it doesn't it doesn't stand out in my mind quite as much as those other two. No, and I, you know, Quiz Show, I think we've talked about uh, Quiz Show just briefly on on this show and and Quiz Show is one that I'm constantly have to be reminded about. Yeah. That I that I like, oh, you really like that one. Yes, yes I did. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great movie, but it is something that kind of it it slips away. But in in time. terms of in terms of impact, you know, in terms of impact, a kind of dramatic impact, I think this is this is a bolder film in in that respect. I mean, what it does, I think, you know, and and maybe it's because I'm watching it with a sort of renewed sense of of wonder is, um, you know, what it does to uh, to to impact the way we look at the world around us again and the weight of the world around us. Uh, I think is um, it attempts to do something bigger and broader and and uh, more audacious than i think pulp fiction does which does what it does really well i'm a big fan of pulp fiction but i don't think it competes yeah in terms yeah, of I scope agree. and scale and and uh, and intention yeah i agree i yeah. agree all right fine i just had to bring that up whatever <laughs> let's uh let's rank it can we do that let's do it all right, so head over to flickchart.com is what you want to do. You want to go to flickchart.com slash the next reel. And when you get there, what you want to do is you want to go and you want to say, hey, I'm going to like these guys or friend them or I want to do whatever you do on, on Flickchart because that is where you can keep up with our stack rankings of all our films that we've talked about. And uh, let's just see where Forrest Gump uh, lands. Where is he going to land? Forrest Gump or The Bourne Ultimatum? Uh, Forrest Gump. Yep, I would do Forrest Gump as well. Forrest Gump or the outlaw Josie Wales? That's a great movie, but I'm still going to say Forrest Gump. Yeah, I think Forrest Gump. Yeah. Uh, the Abyss. <laughs> this is for you, Leisha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going Forrest Gump. Are you really? I am. All right, I'll go yep. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump, or oh, this, you know, this always ends up popping up. This is the this is the wall for Pete. Let's see, all the president's men, <laughs> all the president's men. I would probably pick Forrest Gump, but I'm going to give you all the president's men. Duly noted. <laughs> Forrest Gump or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I'm curious what you would say. I would say Forrest Gump. I'm saying Forrest Gump, and here's my validation. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, I think, falls into the Pulp Fiction category, where I think absolutely it is an amazing script. It's an amazing story uh, that is told really well. Forrest Gump in context of cinema, I think, just is, like you said, it's just so much more audacious. They were really pushing the limits with what they could do, and I think Forrest Gump absolutely wins in this case. Excellent. Forrest Gump or the Hurt Locker? Forrest Gump. Yeah, I'll do Forrest Gump too. Forrest Gump. Oh, and that's it. Oh. We are at number nine. Cracked the top hey. ten. So that's that. uh now wait just a just a minute. So not last with the week before. So we've had two in three weeks that have cracked the top ten. I know, that's pretty rare. Wow. That is pretty rare. And uh next week. 
It, we may have another one. We may have another one. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I think we have uh, two big fans of the, uh, uh, speaking of the uh, awesome films. Yeah. What, yeah are we, next, what are we doing next week? We are uh, not jumping too far forward in, in Tom Hanks' uh, uh, cinematic chronology. We are going to be talking about the awesome, awesome reunion with Ron Howard, Apollo 13. Oh, uh, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This this is great cinema, and uh, this is why we go to the movies. Oh, well, that's true. And Gary Sinise has legs. <laughs> I know. Who knew? What? <laughs> I was. This was. I think probably the film that, <laughs> that demonstrated that. Wow, they just CGI'd those legs right back on that guy. That's right. That's not. That's true. like the technology. <laughs> Oh, yes. Hey, uh, you know what? Uh, good talk, Andrew. I'm I'm glad we threw this one on here, and uh, uh, it's a it's a surprise uh, surprise win. Yeah, it's a great movie. So That's I'm glad great. we picked it. Me too. All right. Anything else for the people? You done? Nope. I'll be right here when you get back. <laughs> I gotta go to bed. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. And some stinkers. Well, true. But you know, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. In season three, we covered even more great adaptations like The Night of the Hunter and It Happened One Night, both part of our Couples on the Run series. We talked about No Country for Old Men, the Coen brothers so rarely adapt someone else's work. We had some fun rom-com adaptations like About a Boy, based on the Nick Hornby novel, and Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, adapted from Rachel Cohn and David Levithan's book. In our terribly and naively named foreign language series, we discussed the brilliant City of God and the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which I won't ever be able to watch again, ever. But could you read the original memoir? I don't know, maybe? We had our Richard Dysart series with adaptations like The Day of the Locust and Being There. Plus, we had that fantastic interview with the man himself. <laughs> the one where we had him sit on the floor? Because this chair was so squeaky. <laughs> Good times. We did our first Tom Hanks series with Forrest Gump, adapted from Winston Groom's novel, plus Apollo 13, based on Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. And we did another year series looking at films from 1981, including Das Boot, Gallipoli, and Thief, all based on books. Listeners can dive deeper into all of these original stories and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, movie, video game. Video game. <laughs> you bet. We have talked about some video game adaptations as well. It doesn't matter the source. Just follow the link. Every purchase supports the podcast. Check out the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and get reading, watching, performing, or playing today.